I don't know if you know this, but when you walked in the doors, you're walking in your home. This is yours. This is not, it's not mine. It's, it's all of ours. It's yours. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you love it as much as I do. I'm excited about it. I'm ex- so excited about it, I want to invite all my friends. How about you? And that's really what we're doing it for. It's, it's a welcome home foy. Yay! Did you say that right? It's a foy. Yay! You guys got to invite your friends. You got to come see my foy. Yay! Oh, that's weird. Anyway, um, in case you're thinking any wrong thoughts of me, not today. Let the devil know, not today. I love that song. I love that song. Yeah, I've, I've, you know, the, the, the words in it all the way through is like, you know, stomp on the devil's head. Anyway, we've had such a great time this summer and heard from so many of our voices and leaders around here. Um, more than I've, I can ever remember, actually, this series. So it's kind of weird that I'm back up here preaching because you're hearing an, a, a normal, an old voice. Old because I got the, you know, the silver look. It's not quite white yet, silver. I'm telling my kids, it's not quite white yet. So I'm not quite old yet. So young men have visions, so I'm still having visions. But today I want to continue with this series called Stories. And uh, it's really been fun because maybe you grew up in a church and you went to Sunday school and you heard the Sunday school rendition of some of the Bible characters that did amazing things, and that's great. But, you know, there's more to it than, than the Sunday school rendition of it. And if you're, you're silver-haired and you went to, to school, you know, Sunday school, maybe you remember the, the flannel things they used to. Anyway, that weird. But today it's different. Um, but you may be one of the people that, uh, you know, you're quite new to faith and you've never even heard. Who is this guy called Moses, David, um, Abraham? And as we went through a, a lot of them, it's just really interesting Today, I'm going to actually teach on what may be the most applicable character in the Old Testament that can really, really speak to our life today. So I want you just to really peel your ears and get ready to to listen and take everything you can in, because I'm going to teach on Daniel. And Daniel, the whole book of Daniel is about how do you live a world-changing, God-fearing impact our, our world lifestyle when you're in a foreign country, foreign culture, in a negative culture. You know, today a lot of people say, well, I would really like to, you know, for instance, like to really, you know, build a great church, but Vancouver. Do you know that the biggest devils are in Vancouver? Do you know that we got the greatest battles are in Vancouver? People all the time are making excuses They look around and they look at the culture and and they use it as an excuse. And I love Daniel because Daniel, if anyone could have played the, the, the victim card, it was Daniel. But he never played it. Instead, he didn't just survive in a foreign, ungodly, negative culture, but he thrived. And he changed the world as a result of it. So I'm excited to get into this and we got some lessons that I hope you're going to walk away excited, because I'm certainly excited about what I've learned in this book. But if you take a bit of the history, um, back about 600 years before Christ, B.C., um, the Babylonians laid siege on Jerusalem and ended up conquering Judah. And as they conquered a country, the king at that time, the king of the Babylonians was Nebuchadnezzar which was a really crazy guy in many ways. If you read the story, you find out how crazy the guy was. Um, he, was he was quite fearful. He was quite, um, had a, a huge temper. Um, but he was, military-wise, he was a little brilliant. And so what he did was very different from most of back in those days when they'd conquer a, a place, they'd just wipe everybody out as much as possible and start over again. But not Nebuchadnezzar. He thought, let's use the best of the best. So he would take captive some of those from where he just conquered. And that's where I'll start out in Daniel chapter 1, okay? Verse 3, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, 
great name. Think about that for your kids. Hey, Ash, Panaz. His chief of staff to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's, listen, royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, good-looking young men. He said, make sure that they're well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge, good judgment, are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. See, what he wanted to do was, wanted to bring the best of the best in to Babylon and put Babylon in them. Basically, he wanted to make them Babylonians and utilize their skills. And if you think about, okay, I want to be like a Daniel, well, then probably you should go to school. Probably you should develop your trade. Probably you should become the best of the best at what you do. Because that was Daniel. And because of it, he was taken captive. Now, now, he was royalty, so his family, probably royalty, was probably murdered. Okay, that's the way you would do it. The conqueror would come in and he would wipe out all of the, the ones in control. But Daniel was a teenager. He was probably 16 to 18 years old in there. And he was taken with his three friends, which were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were all given different names. Why? Because the goal was, we're going to put Babylon in them. And so one of the ways that the enemy would want to put a different culture in you, which actually means would want to displace what's in you, okay? If you're a Christian, what's in you is the kingdom. And the enemy would want to displace the kingdom. And how does he do that? Well, the first thing he did when he brought them in was he changed their names, why? Because if the enemy can take your identity away, if the enemy can take your identity away, then you become pickings, easy pickings for him. And so they changed all their names, and you, most of us know the other three by the other names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but their original names were actually good Hebrew names. And Daniel's name was, is a great name, but they, they changed it to Belshazzar. But... Why did he do that? Well, there's three reasons King Nebuchadnezzar would do that. First, utilize their giftings. Make them Babylonians, utilize their giftings. Number two is you cripple the country that you just conquered because they don't have the, 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 the wise people anymore. They don't have the smart people. They don't have the talented people. They took them all. And then third, you actually guard against the country that you conquered retaliating. Why? Because they don't want to retaliate against you because... Their loved ones actually are in your country. So it was a brilliant strategy that back then Nebuchadnezzar used. Recognize Daniel was a teenager. And why would you want to take teenagers? And for all the teenagers in the room, for all the parents of teenagers in the room, it is really an, an amazing part of your life, time in your life where you're very malleable. You can actually be be changed, you can, you can learn, you can develop so many things. And that's why even around here, I think one of the best things we can do, if, you know, if I was to look at all the things that, that I get involved in, are able to do, one of the things that would be top of my list is pouring into young people. And that's what we do with our interns. And um, we talked about that last week. Timothy was an intern of Paul. And I think for all of us, and as a church, you might notice, even drive by, the first thing you see is kids' stuff out there, outside and in the corner here. Um, we really believe in generations. Why? Because the way you're going to change the world future is right now latching onto, and that's what Nebuchadnezzar was smart enough to do, the teenagers, the young of the day. So... We look at this book, it's, it's really a great example, because Daniel, being a foreigner, being someone that was a slave, being in a negative, negative culture, yet was a great example to us, because through conviction and integrity, he had conviction and he had integrity, God used him. And God can use any one of us 
in any culture. As a matter of fact, a lot of people say, oh, I just wish I was in a nice culture. You know, in a nice culture, you don't stand out. When everyone else is doing good and you're one of them, so what? But when you're in a culture that's really dark and you're a bright, shining light, you stand out. And God has a purpose for you wherever you are. You might be in a job and where you work. I was talking to you know, somebody yesterday and they're saying, everyone around me is so ungodly. Well, that's why you're there. You're there because in the darkness, you can make a big difference. You might be in a school. In a, I remember going to university my first year at UBC in university. You actually had to take English. Today, you think it's the only thing I use today, but back in those days, it was my worst subject. So I took English 101, and my professor actually, about three weeks into the course, asked for a show of hands. Okay, how many in here believe the Bible? And I wasn't sure if I believed the Bible or not, because I'd really not read it. Because I was raised, you know, where we heard about it, but I never did, but my hand went up. And there was like three of us in the room, and for the rest of the year, we were put in the lion's den, so to say, because of what we believed. And you, you might be in a place like that, but God wants to use you in that place. So Daniel is a great example to us. You think of Babylon. Babylon, actually today, we, we utilize that word in a... a um, you know, in a way that's a spiritual illustration. Why? Because Babylon, um, even though it was a historical place, if you go back, it started with the Tower of Babel back in Genesis 11. And it was built by people that were so prideful. We don't need God. We'll just build whatever we want. Isn't that like today? We don't need God. We'll just do whatever we want. And if you go all the way through, even Babylon, when, when Babylon took siege of Jerusalem, do you know what prepared that? It was the pride of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah decided, we've got so much treasure, we're doing so good, we're just going to show off. So there was an, an, an envoy from Babylon that came to visit King. He showed him all the treasures and Isaiah, the prophet afterwards said, did, what did you show him? And he said, I showed him everything you it won't be long, and, and Isaiah prophesied, it won't be long before they come and take everything away, and that's what happened when they conquered, but it was because of pride. Babylon, actually, it's in the book of Revelation. You read it. It's about the whore of Babylon, and really, it's, it's come to mean a, a prideful, negative, ungodly, demonic civilization. And so it really does actually um, describe what we live today in our Western culture today, especially. And the application of this story to our lives is relevant. Why? Because like Daniel, we're all foreigners. Hello? You might think, well, I'm a foreigner because I was born in a, in a different land. If you're born on the planet, you're a foreigner. If you're a Christian. Really. Um, Hebrews 11. This was the children of Israel that were following. Abraham said, you know, God said to Abraham, leave your land, I'll show you where to go. And they followed. And this, is, this was their confession, Hebrews 11. These people accepted and confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on this earth. So just like Daniel, you and I have to recognize this is not where we belong. As a matter of fact, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul writes in the New Testament and he says, for our citizenship is in heaven. We don't belong here. From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming back again. Hello. He's coming back again. But meanwhile, we're here. Like Daniel. In a Babylon-like culture. Hello. The book speaks to today. It speaks to every single one of us. So how did Daniel make such a difference in his world? So let me give you three characteristics of Daniel that teach us how to lead in today's culture. How do we lead in an ungodly culture? Stop being the victim, crying the blues about the negative place that, that we live, the, the school, the workplace, the, you know, all my friends, whatever it is. Let's learn from this. 
So number one, and I'm going to start when Daniel's later on in his years. Why? Because the most well-known story of Daniel is Daniel in the lion's den. So I'm going to start with the characteristic of actually what protected Daniel in the lion's den was Daniel lived a lifestyle of faith. And it was his lifestyle that shut the mouths of the lions. A lot of people think, I want to be like Daniel in the lion's den. <laughs> the Bible doesn't tell us what Daniel did in the lion's den. There's nothing about it in there. But it told us an awful lot about what he did before he got in the lion's den and how he got in the lion's den. And when he was in the lion's den, you can bet it wasn't Daniel that stopped the lions. Have you ever been close to a lion? Ever, any, anybody seen a lion close up? Those guys are huge. I mean, they are so strong. They're, they're huge. I remember one time we're in a safari in Africa with, with Gary and Marilyn, and we're in a, a Jeep, an open-air Jeep, open air. I mean, there's nothing protecting you. And we're, we're out there, and there's a pride of lions coming. And so the, 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 um, the guide stops the Jeep. We sit there, and the lions are going under the Jeep all around us. One of them got under the Jeep and decided he would do a little roar. <laughs> I did about jumped out of the Jeep, but no, but I didn't want to jump out of the Jeep. But those suckers are big. You, you, it's not just that they're going to, with their mouth. It wasn't just shut their mouth. There was, a, there was a protection. God protected. Sounds to me like Psalms 91. Psalms 91 says, when you're in the secret place of the Most High God, no evil can befall you. No lion can go whack and you're dead. Actually, there's a faith style. There's a, there's a lifestyle that gets you. People say, I want to be like, lion, like Daniel in the lion's den. No, 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 no. Instead, want to be like Daniel before the lion's den. Want to be like Daniel's lifestyle that set him up for the secret place in the Most High. He had this confidence in his God. You know, the, the, the decree was by King Darius, who actually was the king of the Medes, which was the, started out Nebuchadnezzar, um, you know, the Babylonians, and then his son Belshazzar, and then the Medes and Persians conquered the Babylonians, but Daniel remained. Even though this is a whole new, you know, regime, he still remained in this place of amazing influence. It will cause you to shake your head when you read the book and you think about how negative the world was at that time and how God used these, these Hebrew believers that had this relationship with God. So King Darius actually wanted, was getting ready to put Daniel over the whole of the country and over all of his leaders, and the leaders got jealous. Hello? New thing, isn't it? No, the leaders got jealous, so, so, so we've got to do something to take out Daniel. They tried to find, what could we find that Daniel was, was, you know, that we could blame him, but he was blameless. Wow. Actually, the Bible says about Daniel that he had an excellent spirit. I love that. Just do what's right. Just do what's right. Serve God, do what's right, and let God look after you. That's what Daniel did. And, and so he had this excellent spirit, and they couldn't figure out any way to trap him, so they used his relationship with God. And they, got, they tricked King Darius into signing into law by the Medes and the Persians, which means you can't take it out of law again, that if anyone within 30 days would petition anyone, either God or man, other than King Darius, they'd be thrown into the lion's den. So here we go. Listen to this. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, okay, it's, he, he was well aware of what's going on here. He went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before God, as was his custom since, as was his custom since early days. When he heard that the decree had been signed, he didn't start praying. He just didn't stop praying. That was his lifestyle. How did the other wise men know how to trap him? Because he prayed like that all the time. It wasn't his first time. It was his all the time. 
You don't wait till you get in the lion's den before you start praying. You pray. You, you have a lifestyle. Wow. Awesome. In the middle of the messiest world, he's, he's out there praying. And so they caught him. They bring him before the king. The king doesn't want to, but he's already signed it into, into law. Can't help. So they throw him in the lion's den. And the next morning, he's still there. <laughs> Petting the lions. I don't know what's going on. You think the lions weren't hungry? Yeah, sure. Read the rest of the story. So the king was, you know, was so happy that Daniel wasn't um, killed that he actually brought Daniel out. But all those that had conspired against him, he took them along with their families, threw them in the lions' den. And the Bible says before they even hit the ground, the lions tore them apart. They were hungry. It's just God can actually protect us no matter what. The, the interesting thing, Bible doesn't elaborate on what happened in the lion's den, it was before the lion's den. And a lot of people want to have that kind of miracle, miracle experience. I just want God to miraculously protect me. Maybe the lion's den is the, the creditors are coming down on you, and I've been thrown into the lion's den, and, and I want God to do a financial miracle. Well, it's maybe a little bit too late in the middle of the lion's den. How about trusting God before you get there? How about living a lifestyle of putting God first? Hello? How about, uh, how about trusting God with, with everything? And that means actually your finances. That's what tithing's all about. People want to have that, that, that lion's den kind of miracle. But it only happens if you've got the lifestyle that Daniel had before that. Maybe um, you get thrown into the den of everybody's against me, everybody's lying. I remember when we first started the church, I, I, I couldn't believe it, but there's actually people that, that I, I, you know, would say things about me. Like, I don't know if you know this, but, but according to some people, I stole all the money in the church. According to some people, there's no money in the church because Pastor John stole it all. When they were saying that, I was actually a dentist, and about half of the bills I was paying. <laughs> I mean, it was like as stupid as you could possibly get, but, but I... If everybody's saying lies against you, what are you going to do? Just stay on the truth. The truth always outlasts a lie. But you don't fight, amen. You don't fight fire with fire. If people are accusing you and, and slandering against you, don't, don't accuse them back. Don't slander back. The Bible actually says a soft answer turns away wrath. We need to learn how, and Daniel was such a great example, how you walk in love. How you actually have a lifestyle that people want to be around you. You know, you, you might have something that you could say in your negative world, but does anyone want to hear it? I know a lot of people that, that over the years, I'd sure like to come and preach in your pulpit. Um, yeah, I've but I don't know if anybody wants to hear what you've got to preach. It's easy to say the right words. It costs you a lifestyle to earn the ears, to hear the words. Daniel had the ears. He earned the ears of three kings. This was the third king he served. And the third king, King Darius, was so upset that, that he signed this thing and Daniel was thrown in the lion's He was so happy when Daniel did not die in the lion's den. Number two, the second thing we learn from Daniel is he spoke the truth in love. And actually, this is talking about um, Daniel was well known for interpreting dreams. And today, if you study psychology, there's actually a lot of people that are studying and learning how to interpret dreams. And, and you might say, well, Daniel was just a really smart person at, at interpreting dreams. No, no, no. The reason that he could interpret dreams is because he knew his God. He knew his God. And the Bible says in Daniel eleven thirty two, 32, but the people who know their God have a relationship with him. As we sang about today, Holy Spirit, welcome in this place. Do you recognize him? Wow. When you know your God, he says, and be strong and carry out exploits. So Daniel knew his God, and he was strong, and he carried out exploits. And as a result, like in Daniel chapter 2, okay, we're starting off, and, and here King Nebuchadnezzar has a really, really troubling dream. The dream is so troubling he can't sleep. 
and something's wrong. Somebody has to help me. So he calls all of the magicians, all the wise people in. He says, you need to tell me what the interpretation of this dream is. Okay, just tell us what the dream is. No, 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 no. You got to tell me what the dream is and the interpretation. But who can do that? No one can do that. You see, you can go to university all your life long and you'd never be able to answer that one. And so King Nebuchadnezzar got so angry that he, he actually sentenced all of them to death, execute them all, including Daniel and his three Hebrew friends. But when Daniel heard about it, here's, here's a really good thing. Understand this. When Daniel heard about this crazy thing the king had said, you know what Daniel's first thing was? His first thing was he went to his small group. <laughs> he went to his relate group. He did. He went to his three Hebrew friends. Boy, it's important that you've got friends that are Christians. Wow, it's important that you've got friends that are Christians. It is so important. Girl, it is important that you've got friends that are Christians. I said boy, so I had to say girl just to even it out. <laughs> First thing he did, he went to his Christian friends, and he got them praying. Wow. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. We're actually going to start here the day after Labor Day, 21 days of prayer. As we launch into this fall, it's, it's almost like launching new. And I, we have such an expectancy of what God wants to do in and through our city. And so come and we'll fill that foyer up every morning and pray. The first thing he did was he got his Hebrew friends to pray. He got in a small group and let's pray. And God gave him the answer. Went back to Nebuchadnezzar, told him the, what the dream was and what the interpretation was. And wow, Nebuchadnezzar put him on charge of everything. See, God will promote you. God will promote you. You don't have to try to promote yourself. God will promote you. And then later on, another couple of chapters, Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. But now he knows Daniel can interpret. So he calls Daniel in, and, 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 and Daniel gets the interpretation. But here's the thing. King, you're not going to like this one. This one is really, this interpretation is the one that says, um, you're going to end up going, going like a wild man, insane for seven years, eating grass and all the rest of it. Uh, and, and see, in our world today, a lot of people, I don't really want to tell people what the Bible says because they might be upset. It might offend them a little bit. Daniel knew that this is not what you want to hear. But it's not how, what you say, it's how you say what you say. Daniel went back to King Nebuchadnezzar and he says, I really, King, I'd rather not tell you this, but this is what it is. And, and because of how he said it, the king appreciated it and actually continued. Daniel had this, this favor with the king. So important how we say what we say. So often it's just, you know, I'm a Christian and I'm going to tell everybody they're going to hell. You might be a Christian, but you're also stupid. No one wants to hear you. What good is it if you have the truth if no one listens? We actually need to have the truth in love. Amen? Oh, you know, there's Jack Harding back there, one of my heroes. One of, one of, of you know, Jack's friends, sitting beside him, got baptized last week. Yeah, all right. And he's like, you, you should actually go talk to him. So he spends a life kind of running from God. God gets a hold of him, and, and he, he, he knows he's got to go back to God. So, so where do you go? He goes to his friend. He says, Jack, I've been watching you. I can see, and whatever you have, I want. Can you take me to your church? Hello. A lot of us, I would like to invite people to church, but they're, oh, they never want to go. Why don't you live a life where they want to go, where you go? Why don't you live a life where they want to have what you have? I don't know about you, but when I walk in a restaurant, I, the first thing, I, I, I don't look at the menu first. I look at what everyone else is eating. I'm, I'm pretty smart. I'll, I'll look around the room, and, and I'll have what he's having. And I think that's pretty well the way people do things. We need to live a life where others want to have what we have. Speak the truth in love. We live in a prideful world that mocks our God. Belshazzar 
Nebuchadnezzar's son having this feast. Really, the feast was all about mocking the God of Israel. And this hand appears out of nowhere and writes on the wall. You, you know the story. No one could interpret it except Daniel. <laughs> and, and Daniel stood up and interpreted and spoke the truth in a really negative world. And we've got that today. We've got a world that mocks our God. But what our world needs is respected leaders who speak clearly, speak with grace, speak with love, speak courteously, and speak in such a word, way that the world will listen. Recognize it took Daniel years of reputation to build that. You know what that's called? It's called the long game. How's your long game? The Bible says that, that, that actually a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. How you doing? Some of you, I don't have any children. I don't have any grandchildren. Someday you will. How are you doing today? We need to live accordingly. Wow, so much stuff in here. Number three, the third thing, really quickly, Daniel purposed in his heart to keep God first. I love that. This goes right back to the very beginning. Daniel chapter one, when Daniel and the three Hebrew children were brought in and the king wanted to treat them the best and give them all the best food and all the rest of it. And Daniel said, no, I can't, I can't, I can't eat that food. Um, why? Because that food actually was, was offered to idols and, and he couldn't defile his relationship with his God. In other words, God is first in my heart and if I ate this food, it would actually displace, defile God in my heart. And so he purposed. I love that he purposed. You know, the best time to avoid the temptation is before you get there. Should I say that again? The best time to avoid a temptation is before you get there. You're teaching your children how to avoid temptations. Talk to them before they get there. Give them the scenario of what would you do with this, 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 this. Purpose in your heart before you get there. And that's what Daniel did. He purposed in his heart, I'm not going to defile myself against my God. The Babylonians had the ability to put Daniel in the culture of Babylon. But what they couldn't do is put the culture in Daniel. Oh, I love that. They could put him in the culture, but they couldn't put the culture in him. And that's true for every one of us. You may be the only Christian on your job. Make a decision. Purpose in your heart. You will not defile yourself. You will keep God first in your heart. Daniel 1.8 says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself against the, by eating the portion of the king's delicacies. And listen to this, though. So Daniel chapter 1, verse 9. Next verse says, Now God had given the chief staff, the guy that was overseeing all of them, both respect and affection for Daniel. Wow. Again, he earned the ears. And it didn't take long. This was, Jan this was Daniel chapter 1. Instantly, almost, almost immediately, he earned the respect and the affection. So listen to how he talked to this guy that was going to make them eat this food that he didn't want to eat. Daniel chapter 1, verse 11 says, Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and, and Azariah. Please, good word to start with, please. Test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. See, we live in a Babylonian-like culture, and we need to love people, respect authority, actually be courteous, live an attractive life such that others would respect and Actually, you have favor with him. You know, the Bible says we have favor with God and man, but he works that through us. You live a favorable life. The devil wants us to, to worship, just not God. Worship the gods of this world. Worship self, big time. Worship sex, big time. You say, well, I don't worship those things. Whatever drives your life is what you worship. Worship success, worship money, big time. Just don't worship God. 
Make a decision not to defile yourself. Let the devil know, not today. Not today, amen? Let the devil know, not today. It's interesting, you know, the words purpose in your heart. I don't know about you, but those words immediately take me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul writes in, about what we give. He says, purpose in your heart. Don't wait until you get there and then, okay, God, what do you think I should give? <laughs> Temptation hits. Purpose in your heart. Purpose in your heart that you'll put God first. Do you know what tithing's all about? Simply put God first. Purpose, 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 purpose to put God first. Malachi chapter 3 tells us if you purpose to put God first, if you tithe, He will rebuke the devourer. 1 Peter chapter 5 says the devil roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If you purpose to put God first, you tithe, God will rebuke the devourer. God is the one that said, eh, eh, not today. Wow, I love that. So, take away. Let me ask you. Have you earned favor to speak the truth? Have you earned the ears that want to hear? Secondly, do you trust your lifestyle of faith? to shut the lion's mouth when you're throwing in whatever you get thrown in. Do it now. And thirdly, simply, is God first? Have you purposed in your heart to put God first? And not allow any, any other gods to displace who's first.